ready? Mm -hmm. Oh wait, is the bread record? Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello, I'm Elizabeth Conley, and I'm here with Kay Abbott at her home in South Dakota. Catherine Abbott. Catherine Abbott. K A K R I N E. Okay. At her home in South Falls, New York, on January 11, 2006. Uh, when and where were you born? Glens Falls. September 8, 1917. Um, you went to high school in South Falls? South Falls. Mm -hmm. uh, and you became a nurse right after high school? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, um, what branch of service were you a nurse for? Uh, United States Army and then United States Air Force. So it became Air Force after the Army. Um, what made you decide to want to be a nurse? Well, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I just wanted to do something. I couldn't go to, we didn't have enough money to go to uh, graduate school. I wanted to be a school teacher. And so we had a large family. We didn't have that much money. So we didn't have. Uh, what do you want, money? The loans. We didn't have student loans then, so someone suggested I would like nursing, so I did apply and I went to Memorial Hospital in Albany for three years service. Um, and what made you decide to be a nurse in the Army? Oh, I think a friend of mine, a classmate, talked me into it. So we decided to go in, and after we heard about the Air Evacuation Squadron, School of Air Evacuation, we applied for that once we had our basic training. And that worked fine. And we went overseas. Okay. And what else do I know right now? How long were you at the school? Yeah, what school? A nursing the, school? Um, the, the nursing for the army. So. Oh, oh, that was just about two months. Two months? Just basic, we went to basic training originally, and then this was something new that they added, mm -hmm. and it was school of air evacuation. Mm -hmm. And I think it was in six to eight weeks mm -hmm. in Bowmanfield, Kentucky at the time. And that was after the war had already started? That you oh, yes. Yeah. This was 1944 and 45. Uh -huh. I'm sorry. And I uh, was discharged in 19, February 1946. When you heard about Pearl Harbor and when the U.S. first entered the war, did you think that you were going to join the Army? Or? No, I had no idea. I was just as shocked as the rest of the world mm -hmm. was and the people. And no, it never entered my mind at the time. And my five brothers went in service, and I thought, as I say, my classmate talked me into going in, and no, I thought it was a good idea. I did the training. I was all I was graduated by that time. Uh, where did you say your first base was? You mean the United States or overseas? The United States. United States, that, uh, that was a Mitchell Field, Long Island. I had basic training. Mm -hmm. And they transferred me to, uh, ooh, I have to remember that, oh, Richmond, Virginia. Mm -hmm. yeah, for just, uh, uh, just a regular nurse, uh, nurse of the Army Corps. They had uh, patients, or they built uh, temporary basic wards. And uh, you went from one ward to another outside because it was just a uh, barracks type thing. Um, and that's when I applied for uh, School of Air Evacuation. Um, what were some of the islands that you flew to? Hawaii. Uh, Johnson Island, that's a small island, Guadalcanal, Guam, Saipan, Tarawa, Biak, Lady in the Philippines, and Okinawa. Um, 
when you flew, did you stop directly at the islands, or would you stop on the Navy hospital ships? No, no, this was just island hopping with our planes. We had nothing to do with uh, the Navy or, uh, or the ships. They had their own uh, Navy nurses, Navy nurse corps. How often would you go out on flights? Oh, well, it all depended on the patients. I mean, the, how the war was going. So it, uh, I can't really tell you that because uh, it, it varied. But we were not uh, waiting very long, really. We shuttled from island to island and were transferred from nurse to nurse, as you would in the wards, you know, of shifts. So we did fly day and night. But there was only one nurse and one medical technician aboard. And uh, they say we shuttled and we just changed planes and we rested until we were called again. So it was just something, I don't know, we just kept things going. Would you ever have to do any overnight stays on islands? Or? Oh yes, many times. And uh, we flew day and night. So as I say, it all depended on how the war was going. And uh, getting the patients ready to be transferred. Did you find it to be hectic? Like, very fast paced? No, not really. We had a few bumps and, and uh, sometimes we, <clears throat> something's wrong with the plane, we had to go back and take, rich, change all the patients and have them moved into the new plane. But that didn't bother me. I mean, they were, they were pretty good because they did have your patients and uh, they tried to have the safest planes for us. As I say, they're just cargo. So were the planes specially marked on the outside, so and no, they were no, 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 they were just Air Force. Mm. Were you ever scared of like enemy flyers? No, yeah. no, no. They had uh, fighter pilots on call or on the alert all the time because of that. But we no, we weren't in the uh, battle areas at all, except for Okinawa. We uh, went in at midnight. We, we flew in from Guam or Saipan on the other islands for eight hours and took off at midnight. And so we landed at eight o'clock in the morning, daylight. And on the first trip I had, <coughs> our Navy was shelling Naha, the southern tip of Okinawa. And that's the closest I ever came. The Japs did uh, go fly below uh, the radar on the island of Biak as I was stationed there. Uh, I took off with a loader patient at 7 p.m. and they flew in at uh, 7.30 p.m. while they were loading another plane. But they just dropped the one bomb and uh, no one was really injured. They hit the enlisted men's area. But that's the only time I came close to any actual fighting. So they meant to make it pretty safe for the patients, you know, at the time as, it, as they were transporting them. Um, how many patients could you fit on one plane? 28. Mm -hmm. So they were really large planes? They were four motored uh, cargo planes. and. Uh, as I say, we carried uh, three tiers, so four in each tier on each side, so that's 12, 12, 24, and four patients on the center of the plane on the floor. All these were safety hooks, as you might say. So that was, uh, that was pretty safe. And then they had some patients that were ambulatory that could, uh, could move. But they were on the top litters because the nurses probably couldn't reach them that far, so we treated the last three rows down. But we didn't have anything that was really, really bad because our planes were pressurized and no oxygen, so we couldn't go any higher than 9,000 or 10,000 feet.
That was that what would be called primitive, because we were pioneers in air evacuation, and they had not just started, as I say. Today, I believe they're much improved. They have the helicopters. And, um, how many, sorry, how many nurses would be on one plane? Oh, it's just one nurse and one medical technician. Per plane? Per plane, yeah. How? That's a good question. <laughs> so you had to attend to all, like, 28 people if you had 28 soldiers on the plane. What would you say? You had to, like, take care of, like, all 28. Oh, yes, yeah, wow. all 28 in the... As I say, they weren't really critical because we had nothing really that they were that not that improved, and these were just transporting them and getting them home. Um, would you and the doctor work with one patient at a time, or would you both go around and check on them like, differently? You mean a board plane while we were traveling? We had no doctor. Oh, there was no. No, just the nurse and the medical technician, and there was no one there. Everyone we were as cargo planes all the way back with nothing but space, and that's where we put the patients on each side of the walls of the plane and down the center, and it was just the uh, the nurse and the technician, the medical technician. Yeah. Where would you, when you went to the islands to pick up the wounded soldiers, where would you uh, receive them? Well, we were on call, and as the patients were being transferred, brought in by ambulance, we would be there to see that they're put on the plane and secure their litters to the wall, to the walls of the plane. They had hooks and a certain snap to them to make sure there's a uh, safe. Um, once you pick patients up, where would you bring them? Well, from island to island. And as I say, we transferred one nurse, we'd take it over, we shuttled. So they were on the plane continuously until they got to Hawaii. And then I don't know what they did, they probably rested. And, been checked out and then they take the long trip home by plane, also by plane. So all the soldiers that you would pick up were wounded enough to the fact that they wouldn't be able to go back into battle? Oh yes, this was de definitely discharge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We also had uh, prisoners of war. Once the war was over, they were released and we, I had a plane full of uh, Prisoners of War, 28, they were all ambulatory, walking around and all, but we had that one plane fall. Were they brought back to Hawaii? Yes. Well, as I say, as we shuttled, we were brought back to, uh, back to Hawaii and probably to the States as soon as, you know, as soon as possible, I suppose, once they were uh, checked out of the hospital. Did you have the opportunity to make friends with any of the soldiers that you helped take care of? No, no. There were too many different soldiers. Mm -hmm. you, you shuttle, you had the uh, different 28 patients all the time, so not really. I don't remember any of them. I'm sure they wouldn't remember me because they also had <laughs> different yeah. nurses and technicians all the time. Were you always with the same technician when you were flying? No, no. no. They were a pretty good group. They were, they were really efficient. They were, they were good crews. Good people to have aboard with you. you know. um, when you were looking after them, uh, how much could you treat them when they were on board? Just giving them pain medication? Yes, mostly that. We had a tuberculosis patient that had was bleeding, got coughing up blood, and, and uh, he was only on here sitting up on the one seat we had there. And uh, usually, the most of it was pain, and uh, 
like codeine, morphine were the only pain medication we we carried, and uh, then we had penicillin. We gave the penicillin shots every three hours, and that was the only medication usually, because uh, we had no well, no facilities, you might say, for any medical treatments or anything aboard the plane. This was mostly for transport and then keeping them comfortable. Because I say that was ancient. <laughs> that was, you know, they were just, just starting out and it was the best they could do. I believe today they must have, you know, your helicopters, they must have everything more so than we did. Of course, it's quite a while ago. But, did the job, we got them home. Uh, how long have you been active before they allowed you that break in Hawaii for? Oh, I don't remember. Just. I wasn't sick or weak or anything. It was just a lull in the war in the work. So I, I can't tell you that really. Um, by the extent of the wounded, did you get an idea of how bad the fighting was? No. 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 We didn't talk about it. Didn't talk about no. it. Was it hard for you to be away from home for that long? No, I uh, I got to California once, and I called home, and I didn't realize uh, it was a three-hour difference. So <laughs> by the time I got to a phone in California, it was 10 p.m., and I called home at 1 o'clock in the morning, and all I heard was, hello, how are you? Everyone, because I didn't, as I say, I wanted Right at the beginning, I didn't realize it was one of three or four different. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't wait to get to the phone, and I say, by the time it was, I got to one, it was 10 o'clock, because there was a lineup for them. I'm sure it was 1 o'clock in the morning. We didn't have much of a conversation, or at least I said hello. Was that the only time you got to talk to them during the war? Yes. Because of, I think, close to the end of the war, because I finished there in, uh, when did I come home? December 1945. And I went in January 1944. And I was overseas. It's, uh, yeah, it's in January 1945. Um, when you were at the bases, what would you do to amuse yourself when you were not? Uh, during the Not much. We read and go to the officers' club. We just sit around and talk. And, and there were dances occasionally, but that's about all. I did not see a movie. And I didn't see any of the USO shows because we were flying different hours and uh, never hit one. <laughs> so I wasn't bored. We read. And, or visited, whatever. You keep busy doing something. And one day we took a duck out. You know, the big truck you drive into the water, into the ocean, we went swimming. Never realized we had sharks around. <laughs> so we do crazy things. That's about all. I mean, it's, when you're young, you just think of something, you know, walking or. <laughs> Whatever an island, island had to offer, we tried. There wasn't much, as I say, not really. There was a few years ago. Um, was there any islands that you enjoyed more than others when you had to stay there for a little while? No, I really didn't think about it. We just took things as they came along and lived with it. Somewhere really very, very hot and humid, like Tarawa, Guadalcanal, and those places. But you did good, you get used to it. And it didn't do you any good to complain anyway, they didn't listen to you. <laughs> um, 
how did you hear about the victory in Europe from the Pacific? Oh, uh, it was I don't remember, but I remember them announcing the death of President Roosevelt and uh, and the end of the war in the Pacific. We whooped it up after that, but I don't remember. Oh, oh yes, they uh, told me from home that my brother, my brothers were coming home from Europe and they are going to be sent to the Pacific, and by that time the war was over. Yeah. Um, did you know about the atomic bomb before they dropped it, or was that a surprise to you too? That was a surprise too, yeah. But they wouldn't tell us that. And uh, we met the crew that dropped the first bomb, and they were the nervous wreck. It's something that, you know, was horrible. But I, uh, we didn't know they were going in, no, I don't believe anyone did. Do you remember what island that they took off of? I believe it was Tinian's. That was uh, near Saipan. And uh, all the B sun, B-19s flew off from there. And occasionally one wouldn't make it. And I'd go in the ocean and find a big black smoke it happened a couple of times and I think that was the outfit that did drop the bomb the B-29s big bombers and it was, those were it. And it was on, on the whole most of the pilots were nervous it was it was nerve-wracking even the fighter they say the Japanese were miserable are you glad that the atomic bomb was dropped instead of them invading Tokyo? I never thought about that. No. I did go to Tokyo after the war was over for five days. But uh, we saw the emperor's fish pond, the sacred carp, the goldfish that are about this big. Huge. But uh, no, I didn't see. But the people themselves were nice, but you see, they did not fight the war or cause the war. And of course, our American soldiers were there at the time, so they didn't, they behaved well. I think the normal people were, had uh, nothing to do with war, you know, fighting it. Women and children and young boys. So the, uh, one our one little waiter there at the hotel, he says, oh, big bird fly you over, drop big bomb, drop big, big bird. They didn't know an airplane, apparently. So the people, the civilians just seem more relieved than anything, probably? Oh, yes. Yeah, they're more, well, they were, they just accepted the loss of the war, but, but they're just like ordinary people. I mean, they just suffered during the war. Um, normal people, everyday people were just as, as, as like we were, and they, uh, they had nothing to do with it. They just had to put up with it. How long were you still in the Pacific until you came home? Hmm? How long were you still over in the Pacific before you came back home? Oh, well, I came home in 1945. I forgot when I went over. Oh, I went over in 1944, December. I remember spending Christmas there. And uh, I it was maybe nine months, nine, ten months. I'm trying to figure out the time. <laughs> sure. uh, when you went back home in 1945, did things seem different to you or changed at all? No, it's good to be home. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't go back to work for about three months. Okay. One month, but that was all right. It was relaxing. Yeah. Um, 
How do you think the war has influenced your life? I never thought about it. <laughs> I didn't. I went to, unless I uh, added that to my pension check. Pension. I worked for the VA hospital for 28 years, and I had two years service, like federal service for 30 years, and did well pension wise. Um, how did you get your air medal? Oh, I had over a thousand flying hours in the Pacific. Yeah. Who recommends you for those medals? Well, they kept a record of uh, the. Uh, hours of flight you automatically get it if you have over 1,000 flying hours yeah, in the comic so. have you kept in contact with anyone that you met in the war well some of my uh, flight nurses that uh, were in my squadron i think there's only two of us left i just heard that uh, one of them uh, in Connecticut just died three days after the Amarasa died. And uh, there's one that's very sick in Washington, D.C. She's the one that had the, the her daughter had the twin babies. <laughs> and there's a, just, a couple, just a couple more, two or three, four more. Of course, we're all up in age. They had to be at least 21 to be an RM. I hear from them, and that's about it. As I say, there's not too many of us. We're all old women. Uh, yes. I hope you don't get a failure on this. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, do you have a memory that sticks out in, in your mind the most about the war? No. I don't know, I just think back, but I wouldn't be very interesting to other people. But I can't think of any offhand. It was an experience, and I lived through it, and I enjoyed it, really. I mean, and doing something worthwhile. So you're glad that you did it? Oh, yes. Yeah. That was an experience, yes. Yeah. Very much so. And I'm so glad it's improved because it was really just basic. And now it's, a, it's really improved. You can tell by that from the news you get in Iraq and the country. For evacuation, you know, the patients, they have the helicopters in there much more efficient. And Safer, I think. Do you think it's important for teenagers like me to learn about World War II? I think so, yes. It's part of history. As anything else, you know, from looking back at it and, and noticing all the improvements going on. How things in medicine improved, how the war and you know what else to say. Life is improving and it's changing, but it keeps moving. And yes, I think it should be part of the history. It is history. Is there anything else that you'd like? No, nope, I'm going to say I quit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Hey, you're welcome, but I mean, I hope I have. Um, there are not too many of us. Let me say I talked to one, two, three. For those cameras like that, that can. A little part. <laughs> yeah, I right guess now. so. <laughs> well, you girls are lucky, you got a beautiful. <laughs> find the one as I showed you on the, mm -hmm. on the sweater it was the the, the wings are beautiful